here just a moment. So we're, we're gonna try something here. Uh, let me see. A toy wants us to try this with her bringing me onto her video. So we're gonna do that. Toy is gonna bring me onto her video. So let's give that a try. This works too. I'm just not sure if I'll be able to flip the camera. Let me see real quick. Will this still work? Yes. Okay. Because I need to be yeah, able to show you your fabulous self. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so nice to see you. It's I'm so, so good. sorry for this. I was kind of hoping to do this on my computer as everything is a little higher quality that way. Also internet. But like you said, this is the life that we're living now. Yep. I'm going to be a little shaky while I prop everything up. First. No problem. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am surviving. Um, I'm really happy to see you, though. I'm really happy to see you, too. I don't know why. It's a little dark here for some reason. I have lighting, and it's, it's not getting much brighter. You look fabulous, so it really doesn't matter. It's all about you anyway today. I think this is, uh, the, maybe this is the advantage of a tiny camera. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to edit what people see. Fun, fun. So welcome to my show, Women of Dance. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I appreciate you giving me your time. I know that it is very valuable as you are one of the most sought after women in this business, I think, um, whether it be as a coach or a performer, I mean, I know I look up to you. I know a lot of our dancers look up to you. So um, I hopefully I won't make you blush too much or cry, but uh, this is about you and just showcasing the women in our industry and how much they've done for it and giving them, you know, all the credit that they deserve. So I wanted to talk to you. Um, let's get into the very beginning before your salsa life. Uh, when did your dance life begin? Oh my God, my origin story. Yeah. Uh, I often make jokes about my origin story because I didn't get to find dance as early as I probably would have wanted. Uh, I grew up in this tiny island called Guam. And so there aren't that many resources there, but we got lucky in a, in a couple of ways. But I think I was trying to dance in a lot of ways before I could find dance. Mm -hmm. For example, I was a competitive swimmer and I often joke in my class how I really would focus so much on my form and my technique because mm -hmm. I was trying to dance underwater, but I would always lose matches. Like I would never swim fast, you know? So clearly I was missing something about that technique. I love and that I also dance underwater. <laughs> yeah, right. I should have switched to like, uh, what do you call this? The synchronized, synchronized swimming? swimming. Yeah. So I did a bunch of other things like that before I found this wonderful ballet school. At the time, it was the only ballet school, but we had a principal dancer from the Joffrey and from the Houston Ballet oh, nice. um, come to Guam and train all of us. And that person really got us uh, so many opportunities to train in ballet in the U.S. as well, even though back then to attend an audition would have been impossible for us coming all the way from the middle of the Pacific. So we used to send VHS tapes and hope to get accepted and then go live in the states for as long as we could manage in between wow. school. Well, wow. I'm I'm curious. I know in America, for example, the standard ballerina, I, I say it's the George Balanchine effect. Um, you know, minimum five set like five, 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 seven, a hundred pounds. Personally, I also came from ballet, and the one thing I always heard growing up was you'll never make it as a ballerina in this country because you're not tall enough. And I'm wondering, was that the same case in Guam? Because I know in England, for example, at the Royal Ballet, I went there and their ballerinas are much more than us. <laughs> They're shorter. And I was like, oh, so maybe it's just an American thing. I'm wondering if it's the same in, in Guam. We were really lucky. Our teacher, his name was John Grensback, um, and he's white, but 
luckily he, you know, he was teaching a group of brown girls and we all have, you know, Islander body types. You don't have the white prototype body types, but he just let us grow as best as he could. He nurtured us as best he could. I can say that um, with a lot of appreciation um, now, because as soon as we got into the stateside schools or the, uh, in the U.S. Or, or outside of Guam, it hit us really hard what the expectations are oh, for, for our sure. bodies, for the prototypical ballerina. It was a, for me personally, I, I won't speak for everybody, but for me, I went to the Houston Ballet first, and that was the first time that I was going to find out that, one, I'm brown, and I'm not what people expect in a ballerina, but also that my race, as it per is perceived in Texas, in Houston, is Mexican. And I was one of two brown people at the Houston Ballet. Wow. Uh, and that came with a whole world of new and painful experiences for me. So I'm hoping, I know that things have changed a yeah. lot. Um, I'm thankful for John that he helped us learn and enjoy as much as we could before other people were going to tell us mm -hmm. what we could and could not do. So I'm very thankful for him for that. That's wonderful. I mean, I feel like a great teacher can really have such a profound effect on your life. And it sounds like John was one of those for you. He really was. And we're lucky. It could have gone any number of ways. For real. The fact that we had someone who was genuinely qualified to train us at a very high level so that a lot of us were became professionals um, eventually, um, but also to not damage us and prevent us from pursuing our dreams. That could have happened much earlier. It was going to happen in this yeah. body and the skin. It was going to happen, but it didn't have to happen at such a tender age, you know. And how, how old were you when you made the switch from ballet to ballroom? Because that came next, right? Right. That came next. Around 16 or so. Okay. So we'll talk about that transition. How did you end up going from ballet to international Latin ballroom? I think it's quite a natural transition because, as you know, the upbringing in ballet is very strict. It's very mm -hmm. technical. And so when you switch into the ballroom system, it's very similar. The approach is very similar. Um, to me, just as a technical point, it's easier to transition um, from classical ballet to Latin ballroom in some regards in terms of the leg technique, although it's a little bit easier to transfer into like waltz and foxtrot with the posture. Um, but it was, uh, I think it was also the only thing that was available to me at that time. Um, in Guam, we danced the cha-cha-cha because we were a okay. former Spanish colony. And so we share a lot of culture um, with Latinos and with Mexicans in particular. And so we culturally embrace the cha-cha-cha. And so dancing cha-cha in a professional setting was very satisfying for me at the time. And then coming here to, uh, to the U.S. and to New York specifically, I helped to found the dance sport team at Columbia. So there's a collegiate dance sport mm -hmm. circuit um, and did a lot of work in that world, which is just really fun hanging out with other uh, college students and discovering the world of dance. Do you have a favorite ballroom style that you loved competing in? I always wanted to dance the modern styles while it's Foxtrot Tango. Uh, but like you said, I am too tiny. That's what I'm told. Uh, so, you know, race plays a big factor always, as I would discover throughout my life, that as soon as I got into ballroom, my coaches were always like, you're a Latin girl. Yep. You're small, you're fast, you're brown. And they just tried to this. pigeonhole you in there. Like, you were guided. Oh, I wanted to that. waltz. I wanted to waltz. <laughs> you get to do a lot of stuff right now, I feel like, more with the adage and the, and the cabaret stuff. You almost get to incorporate some of that like that grace and elegance that you wish you got to do when you were in your ballroom days. Yeah, I'm very happy that I get to do that. And I'm thankful for Billy um, that we found each other because we have similar, I guess, aesthetic tendencies um, just okay. based on our experiences growing up and our particular training. It makes sense to do it. The style is more American ballroom. Yes. And it fits with a dodge really nicely. There's a whole like tradition of doing a dodge within the genre of American 
style ballroom, but it can be done in so many different ways, which I'm happy to explore too. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk. We'll get to Billy later. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, everything nice. I promise Billy, if you're watching, please don't yell at me. That. Um, yeah. so we're going to talk about your beginnings in the salsa scene. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, you started with Santo Rico, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about it, your time with Santo Rico. Well, actually it goes back a little bit further because as I'm telling you this story of starting in the ballroom circuit in New York at Columbia, um, you know, I, I ended up hanging out with Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Oh. I didn't realize it was happening, but I'm getting invited to parties. There are these natural friendships that come from shared culture and shared ways of showing affection and uh, expressing who we are. I ended up in these awesome parties, dancing merengue, bachata, salsa, and I didn't know that I was doing that, but it was such a comfortable world to be in. Um, my friends who were older used to sneak me into Latin Quarter and all the clubs in New York City before I was legally of age. And I'm standing <laughs> on camera. Um, we all door. had those friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm dancing salsa and having a great time, just not really realizing what I'm doing or how um, expansive this world was going to be, as mm -hmm. I would find out. So I actually ended up training in... Um, modern ballroom and I broke my foot um, wow. from just constant training and putting a lot of pressure on my body, um, trying to meet expectations of a much taller person gliding across the floor. And once I broke my foot, I was told it was going to take about a year, a year and a half to heal. I was devastated. This would be the first time in my entire life that I would have a prolonged break from wow. dance. And as I know now, it is not um, good for my mental health. So I was living in Washington Heights at that time. And uh, I just happened to be just a couple blocks from Santo Rico. And I didn't realize what I was getting into. But I thought I'll just learn salsa for a little while until I'm able to heal. I can go in with sneakers. I thought it was going to be low intensity, low impact. <laughs> um, I ended up at Santo Rico. And within a couple months, I was training with them because I mean, it's a new world. And once you are privileged enough to get into it, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think anyone would ever turn away. Agree. It's just so love. Yeah. It's, it's a very fun world and very seductive. Like once it kind of sucks you in, you're, you're in it. It's hard to break away. Yeah. Right. Uh, people used to say that all the time. I got bitten by the Mongo bug, mm -hmm. the salsa bug, whatever that is. It just fulfilled so many things that I, had wanted not only was I going to understand myself and the way I fit into this society better I was going to understand what my people have in common with Latinos especially Caribbean, Caribbean Latinos but I was also going to be able to work really really hard at something in a technical matter in a competitive manner and in an artistic manner and it gave me the opportunity to travel all over the world and meet new people and discover new things how long were you with Santo Rico about four years, I would say, four, yeah. And were you doing any choreography with Tomas or what was yeah. your role with the company for those that don't know? Because not everybody um, watching is from the scene, so we gotta, you know, clarify for them. Yeah, <laughs> that was it, it was a tough world. I, I think a lot of it, I, lot, I think a lot of salsa companies are structured similarly, but it's very much like there's a lot of people, um, there's only a few spots, there's so much talent, and so if, for me, if I wanted a chance at one of those spots, I had to hang around, work diligently on the side because mm -hmm. there weren't a lot of resources, a lot of people available to help me um, learn things and catch up. And then right when that opportunity came, I had to jump and grab it. That's it. That's you just get lucky one day, hopefully, and then you're <laughs> ready when the time comes. And then after that point, it was just like full on acceleration, traveling right away ended up dancing with Tomas directly and then ended up uh, choreographing and, and doing all those things. Um, one of my favorite things that Tomas um, allowed me to do is mm -hmm. to design my own curriculum and my own class. And at well, that time, interesting. You know, he had a, huh? What's that? That's pretty interesting that he gave you that it was, opportunity. Yeah. That's great. I think at that time, he was like a single 
single singular personality at Santo Rico. And so he designed everything. We had classes all week long, but he gave me like the least desired spot, which was a Monday night. Nobody wants to dance salsa on a Monday night. And we would talk a lot about concepts and uh, the gap between intermediate and advanced dancers, for example. Tomas's class was so famous at that time. On Sundays, all the best dancers would come to the studio and just get down. And I noticed that it was really hard for people to make the jump from a regular standard intermediate class into his class. And people really wanted to have that experience. So we tried to fill in the gaps in terms of people's training and education. And so my Monday class was like a specialized um, topic to help those people get through. And that's where I got a lot of my, I started thinking a lot about salsa concepts, what it means to have a technique in salsa, where, what are all the influences in salsa, how to structure it so that people can understand it better. And I'm really thankful that he allowed me to do that and also nurtured my curiosity in that regard. So Tomas was your guide for Santo Rico, but who did you look up to in terms of female salsa artists at the time? Like, did you have someone that you kind of used as inspiration? Yes, Nina, Nina Ortiz. Nina Ortiz. My first salsa teacher, uh, first lady styling teacher. Oh, wow. I, was, I always thought it was odd that there was a topic for lady styling specifically because I think I was already, even then, resistant to this idea that men dance one way and women dance another way. And also, why do we have to have a special class? I'm sure we're going to talk about this later. But <laughs> why is it that we're in majority of salsa classes, the women are silent and not... Usually, the only time that women students are being addressed is when we're doing something wrong and we're not cooperating. Oh, and then there's just one said, class. You said so much in that one statement. Oh, you could just unpack yeah, so that one. Styling. And I want to give credit to my teacher because I miss her and I love her. Um, but she really inspired me. Um, she was just, she comes, I'm gonna say she comes from salsa royalty. Her father was also a, a salsero. And she was just so natural. So obviously born to dance salsa. And it was a mystery, a frustrating mystery to me because back then from ballet training, I approached everything in a clear cut way. Step one, step two, very linear yep. learning. And she helped me understand that this has to come from a different place that almost what you do in salsa because it's so fundamentally afro-cuban you have to approach it from a an experiential way you can't mm -hmm. be looking at yourself and analyzing your form you have to find where the movement and the impetus the momentum the impulse is coming from in the inside capture that feeling hold on to it and try to reproduce it it's a totally different way to learn but i still think of her in my learning journey now yeah. Now, uh, this was still from Santo Rico. When did Basso come into play? Baila Society, for those, again, that don't know what Basso stands um, for. 2006. 2006 is when we started. So we turned 14 in the pandemic. Um, oh. Yeah, so we've been around for a while. And talk to me about the beginnings of that journey. I had stopped dancing again. I was in graduate school. Um, I was working at Columbia. I was doing a lot of uh, work. Daniel and I started uh, training together and along with a very small group of friends. And we really wanted, I think fundamentally, we wanted more people to know about salsa. From Daniel's perspective as a white man, he felt like it was hard for him to access this very beautiful, but, you know, like, um, I guess, it was not, it was not easy for him to get into, it wasn't as easy as getting into a salsa class, it, at, into any class where you just pay your money and you get what you want. Mm -hmm. You had to go into a world and you had to go into a community of people who had created this and had kept it alive and had innovated in it and were, you know, enjoying it. You have to approach it with, you have to be courageous and you have to be open and I'm speaking for him right now. Um, <laughs> so when, I think for him, he really wanted more people to know how wonderful salsa is. That's, that's really what it was about. And so we thought that if we could take salsa to more places, um, especially in Manhattan, it was a, a little odd. Like back then, we danced in Washington Heights. We danced in the Bronx, right? Um, there were a couple of schools in Queens that were just starting to crop up. But there wasn't a lot in, in Manhattan except for ballroom. 
So hmm. it felt a little weird to go to another community, dance community, where they're dancing salsa, but it isn't what we know as New York style salsa. So we started Basso, we started teaching in Manhattan. Um, that became our territory. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> had their turf. <laughs> yeah, our turf, right, our turf, yes. Um, and I kept my Monday class because I think I, by then I had a reputation for like filling the days that nobody else wanted. <laughs> so I took a Monday night, I took a Friday night, and I was like, we're going to do technique, just technique. We're not going to even do choreography. We're just going to like really examine this with a lens. And so the people who like to learn like that came to me. And then the people who had extraordinary trouble learning salsa or felt very anxious about trying to get into a salsa community came to me. So that's, those are my people. Those are your people. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You could teach technique, like as someone who's taken like technique workshops from you, you get into so much detail, which I personally love. I mean, I feel like I could talk technique for hours. Yeah, I know you love it. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, what when yeah. you're talking to new students, right, and you have new ones come in, there's always that question of what is more important to learn? Patterns yeah. so you can go out and social dance or technique, right? When you're talking to these baby dancers that come in, do you, because you're a technique person, do you go the technique route or do you still try to give them the basics so they can go out and social dance and not screw the technique, but, you know, what is well, your priority as an instructor? Yeah, right. What's the priority? I learned a lot over these. It's now my 18th year, 19th year dancing professionally in salsa. So I did totally approach this like, I'm going to go all the way. This is about perfection. I'm going to use all the things that I learn in ballet. I think I have the secret. I think I have an advantage. If I learn it this way, the same way that I learned growing up with so much valuable training, I'm going to win. Took me forever to figure it out. I'm going to admit something here because I think it's very important for everyone and I think it has larger implications. But when I started Basso, I made the mistake of assuming that what I, because of my classical training, that what I was gonna bring was sophistication mm -hmm. to salsa. And that was very arrogant of me because salsa is already sophisticated. I didn't know enough to appreciate it at that time. So my whole journey since then up until now is trying to realign my priorities with what already exists, the beauty and the complexity that already exists in salsa and Afro-Cuban dance. So now when a beginner comes to me, arrives in my class, I try to figure out what their goals are. But I think the number one, the number one most important goal is to share the culture of salsa not just the dance, but if we can open this world, this community to someone else, someone new, they learn how to appreciate it in a respectful and a sincere way, then everything else is gonna happen. They will be the, the driver of their own journey. They'll decide, do I wanna do this in a competitive way? Do I wanna perform? Do I just wanna get down in a club? Um, and I can do all of those things with them. So now the story is so much more important to me than any of the steps or the techniques ever could be. I love that. That's, that's such a great like piece of knowledge for anyone thinking to get into teaching. Those are such words of wisdom. Like if anyone's watching, I hope you wrote that down. If you're looking yeah. to teach, learn the importance of being a sophisticated and salsa being sophisticated. I mean, you guys look salsa so elegant crazy. dancing together. Um, when you and Daniel partnered up, did you guys start competing right away too? Because you guys did some theater art stuff, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. No, that was so many years later by the time. I mean, so the old, the way the industry used to work in the old days. <laughs> in the old I days. The old it. days. <laughs> is that you had to establish yourself as a performing arts company, um, just like word of mouth. And then the organizers and promoters of different events, salsa festivals, will find you and invite you and you'll be part of the lineup. Back then, most of the important companies were in New York, obviously. And um, the organizers knew that they were going to have to make this big investment to get all of us there. The competitions were starting around the same time that I was establishing myself. 
And so by that point, we're already, I'm not going to say grandfathered in, but if the point of getting into a competition was to achieve some sort of like a uh, title or a way to enter into the industry, get invited to a festival, um, there was no need for us at that generation to do that. We became the judges of the first competition, of the first more formal established like ESPN competitions, right? Mm -hmm. And so after that, it didn't make sense to get back into the competitive world because we already were in the circuit working. Um, Daniel and I ended up competing in the bottom circuit, obviously completely different world, so that we could train in a new genre. And I could return to some of my skills from ballet. I had al always been in a Dodge girl um, at my academy. Um, small, small people get picked up a lot. All and, the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. So obviously I love it. I had a really great time with the art form. I had a mm -hmm. horrible time competing but it's just you know it's a tough did thing you not you like competition to... oh no i hate competition <laughs> i'm gonna go into i'm gonna go on record saying that yes i hate competition and wow I really hate people who do it <laughs> I really wow all of you all of you competitors who are watching your judge thinks you're awesome when you see me smiling out there while you're dancing it's not fake I am genuinely enjoying all the hard work and all the love that you're putting out there. Did you feel that way when you were doing ballroom? Did you not? Yeah, like, I hated it. You hated it there too? I always <laughs> hated it. The only thing I want from competition is excellence. <laughs> That's all I want. No, no pressure for us competitors. She just wants excellence, ladies and gentlemen. I, all of us that are watching are sitting there like, Crap, I mean, that's what it's about, up. right? Because that's what it's about. It's about excellence. Otherwise, why are we comparing one person to another, right? There's really no need in life for a happy life. There's no need to compare yourself to anyone ever. Very true. Competition. We're looking for excellence. We're all also hoping that in a big way, the competition is going to further the art form and it's going to grow the community it's going to create more awareness for what we know and love that's what we're hoping to and excellence is a huge part of that um but yeah if i can like be the best that i can be without ever competing i will so performing having a company teaching those are all wonderful activities that have helped me become a better dancer we have a question uh that jessica asked earlier and i'm gonna put it in here now. So because we were just talking about the adage and everything and coaching, the question is, can you share a bit about coaching adage as a flyer? No disrespect to the men coaches, but I don't see women being sought after as coaches. And that leaves us flyers kind of figuring out our role on our own, so to speak. Jessica, true story. True story. <laughs> True story, true life. Also, how sad is it that we have to apologize? I know. When I announced this show, I had to like make a little apology. Like I did my intro and I said, no offense to the men, but you guys get enough exposure and this is about the women. This so I'm not going to ask the guys to be on the show. Don't be upset. And that's sad that I had yeah. to make that type of statement. Yeah. It's a man's world. And you know, what we do is extremely gendered, you know? So there are always gonna be major issues with that. We're not talking about the actions of individuals. We're talking about systematic um, ways of thinking, ways of doing things, ways of being, um, gatekeeping, policies and actual laws that make things not just that prevent women from doing things but just making things really hard for us to do so from the flyers perspective i would say in general people who follow mm -hmm. have a lot to contribute to partner dance because it obviously doesn't work if it doesn't make sense to us you can absolutely teach from a following perspective mm -hmm. and it works really well for some leads who are who learn a different way so maybe they don't learn by 
emulating or you know visually copying somebody maybe they don't learn with um, audio cues maybe they learn experientially or they have a more tactile way of learning a kinetic way of learning and those ways are that so the follow is extremely valuable in that perspective for flying i don't think people realize how much technique enters into our perspective being the ones in the air and exactly how this is going to work obviously it is really a mistake to think that if you're going to be a base that you could just pick someone up and make it work so here's a basic concept for you and i know you know this as a flyer um if you're a base so there's two ways you can make flying you can make a dodge work one is you're a base and you're super strong so you just pick anything anyone up from any point in their bodies in any position and it's all you right so that's yeah. a lot of strength we know that most people don't have the other way to make a dodge work and i'm simplifying is if you have an excellent flyer who is really good at understanding um, their point of balance their center of of mass right so they're going to be manipulating themselves in the air to make sure that they are at that perfect balance point so they're doing you a lot of favors um so we clearly want to strike some sort of middle ground where bases don't have to be that strong and flyers don't have to be that like wiggly <laughs> and yeah, right? manipulate and adjust in the air so much but something in the middle right that allows more people and more opportunities to create shapes and lines in the air, different ways of lifting, you know. It's, it's, it's tough to say that it goes without saying, because I really do think people haven't examined their own uh, ideas about how this worked, how partner dance works, how adage works, how yeah. conveying information about dance works. Why shouldn't it make sense from a follows perspective? I mean, exactly. some people say it actually makes a lot more sense. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's really the perception of power. As let's just confine our conversation to competitors. You've okay. got a competitor who wants to do salsa cabaret. They know that they need some sort of training and education. They go looking for it. If they have limited resources, they're going to spend those research resources on the person that they think gets the most, gives them the most bang for their buck. It's going to be someone they don't realize it's someone that they perceive to have the most power and authority. Hmm. They're going to pick a guy to teach them yeah. what they want to teach. Now, if there's unlimited funds, they might, you know, experiment. They might like try things out and, and see if it works with someone else. But, you know, we're talking, a, we're a majorly disadvantaged community. So now the power structures that exist in regular life are even bigger here because there's not that much room to figure other things out and to explore. There's not a lot of money here, time, yeah. resources, you know? Do you find, to piggyback off of Jess's question, because you do work so much with flyers and you got like for your private lessons when you're coaching, do you find it difficult to be able to work with a couple if you don't have a male partner as an instructor. So let's say you're doing a private with a couple you've never worked with before, and it's just you working with them. Would you feel comfortable having the guy lift you to explain, like, how would you do that? Because I know for me, I would, like, if I'm working with an amateur that wants to do lifts, like, I'm, I would be hesitant to do it without maybe bringing Darlin if the guy has never done a lift before because I don't want him dropping me. Um, right. Or I will tell the student, like, if you want to do a pro-am that's cabaret, you need to have an amateur partner to practice with so that right. you're not testing it out on me all the time because if I get hurt, right. I'm out of work. Um, so this, this is actually what, what you thing. said. It brings up another issue, which is, not only is it harder for us to get opportunities, right? To work, earn money, perform, whatever it is, but we also take more risks. And what you said is a very direct example of that because we're flyers and we're women, we are taking a lot of risks with our bodies and our own health when we are taking on projects by ourselves. The rest of it is more of a matter of style um, I have learned over the years how to work a base up 
to lifting without me having to actually lift. Although Jessica knows that I've been in class like with a chair or a teddy bear, mm -hmm. like demonstrating technique, right? <laughs> it's just a matter of proportion. I know what I'm talking about. So if you give me a person that I can actually manage, then I can show you what we're doing. But I think most people, most students are actually very earnest at, and doing their best in a, in, a, in a classroom setting. They're paying attention with all the, all the ways that they've learned how to learn. Um, and they don't seem to have a problem with that at all. I almost never have a base with me teaching just because it's not feasible. I'm gonna lose out economically, right? There's also no need. Um, it challenges me to convey ideas concepts in a in a better way mm -hmm. every single time um and i taught edwin how to base <laughs> we're gonna get and into that, you and edwin later for sure yeah. and i found a video treat <laughs> that i i found on my uh my dig that i went on i cannot wait to show that and see your face i hope edwin is watching if he's not and he catches the replay he will definitely yeah. have a laugh for sure. Um, but yeah, you've definitely, I mean, I know from working with you, I remember you giving me exercises as a flyer that I could do on the floor. In fact, I think I made like a boomerang of one once. But like, yeah. there's, there are ways that we as flyers can improve ourselves without oh, yeah. the man. Right? So like besides the little exercises, like if someone who's watching right now wants to get into a dodge, what type of things can they do on their own to get their bodies right for something like that? Because there's a misconception about what it is that we're doing up there that makes that strength too. Like, yeah. So yeah. talk about that a little bit. Well, we're getting into perceptions of power too, right? Why does a dodge even work? Why do people admire guys who do a dodge? Because it's fundamentally a balletic form, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's traditionally a balletic form of dance which is perceived as more feminine. If ballet boys get so much flack, how come the dodge boys don't? It's because of perceived power. People perceive these men as strong, therefore powerful in society, not just physically strong, they're admired. People look up to them, right? So someone like Billy can, you know, dance in a very soft and somewhat feminine way, maybe very feminine way, but because people know that he's lifting people up in the air overhead, they think he's powerful. Yeah. He is. He is. But have we ever given any thought to what that means for women or flyers? What is their form of power? Anyways, the training thing for flyers, there's so much. There's so much to do. A lot of what we're doing fundamentally is dancing. We're dancing in the air when we're dancing in very unusual circumstances. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if you're a master of walking around the earth, right, as a human, and suddenly you go to space, you have to figure out all the human things that you used to do in a completely new set of circumstances, right? Gravity is different, space is different, momentum, weight is different, um, mm -hmm. even your orientation is different. So we're taking what we learn our whole lives, dancing with all the rules of the earth and the world, and we're doing it in the air all in different shapes and different uh, directions. So to train involves learning how to dance, learning how to reorient your mind so that you can dance in different orientations, as well as conditioning your body to make sure that you are strong is not the word. Adaptive, I would say, is a better word because you're not going to be a block strong right? And no amount of that kind of strength is going to help you be a flyer, nor a base. But I would say adaptive. You have to use your strength when it's necessary. You have to use your flexibility when it's necessary. And you have to use your mind and your ability to reorient yourself in the way you think when it's necessary. When you judge a competition and you're judging the cabaret divisions, for example, when a trick goes wrong, what is your immediate thought as a judge? Because we all know things happen in competition. You know, things go wrong, people fall or whatever. As when you're scoring this as a judge, like what is going through your mind there? Like, are you thinking well, it really it's the depends. guy or what? Say again? 
Like, are you looking at it as like the guy, the base messed up or the, like, what is your immediate go-to thought? Uh, I don't think any of those things. I try to judge it and uh, I try to judge the move specifically because there are so many different techniques and there are moves that are really dependent on what the flyer does. And there are obviously moves that are really dependent on what the base does. So it depends on, on what that particular situation is. Um, I will say from an artistic perspective, from a performance perspective, when a dodge is such a peculiar art form because your goal is to do something that people immediately recognize as difficult yes. or superhuman, right? It's part artistic, but it's also part just like entertainment and show, showy. It's a showcase. We're doing it to impress people, not just to express a message or an emotion. And so the moment you mess up, Mm -hmm. You are awakening the audience to the dream that you've already put them in with this like magical, unbelievable world where men are strong and women are tiny and beautiful. <laughs> so once you disrupt that and you make a mistake, mm -hmm. the audience doesn't just wake up to the fact that they're sitting in a chair and watching people craft something from their entertainment, but they also become afraid. Yeah, They're afraid for you they're afraid for themselves um, as they're watching. That's part of the suspense. The fear in the back of an audience member's mind is what makes Adash so entertaining. But once you haven't been able to show it in its best form, mm -hmm. it's just scary and it's the complete opposite of entertaining. Yeah, right? now they're just sitting there terrified that you're not gonna break yeah. their head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in this, to answer your question, your specific question, I approach it all based on the move. Um, and then I know the reality of when you're choosing your, your moves, your adage moves uh, in a choreography, you can do a little math. This move, um, we are successful at it 80% of the time, 80% of the time. If we do it the way we intend, it comes out 80% of the time in rehearsal. For me, that's not good enough. 80% yeah. is not enough, especially considering how dangerous the moves are, but also with your goal. Like if it were for, for a show, I don't think I would do it. If it's for a competition, I definitely wouldn't do it. I want that rate, that success rate to be very, very high for a competition. I want to show mastery at all times. It doesn't really matter who messes up in the moment. It's about consistency and you can calculate your probability over rehearsals over some period of time before you ever get out there on the floor. You know, let's say you have two couples that have gone out and they both dance dance wise, same level, right? It's clean, perfect. One couple has tricks that are harder, like way more difficult, but they maybe aren't executed perfectly in the comp versus a couple that dance the same way. Tricks are way easier, but they're executed perfectly. Who gets scored higher? So the way that the system is set up now, there are there are points that are allocated specifically for difficulty and there are points that are allocated for other features of the dance. So luckily judges don't have to make a, they don't have to create a score in its totality, especially mm -hmm. for a showcase dance. For other types of competitions we do, we give one score based on our overall impression. For this particular case, if we draw two extremes, it's a little bit too simplistic. Like it would be almost like a person, let's do it in salsa since more people understand salsa better. It would be more like a beginner doing like a perfect basic for two minutes versus um, an intermediate dancer doing like a intermediate syllabus, but maybe doesn't have great technique. They're not really comparable mm -hmm. dancers and they ought to be in different categories for one. Um, but also I think there's a deeper issue, which is how do you judge the difficulty of an adage move? Because I don't think most people realize that the most, some of the most difficult moves are actually difficult because your goal is to make them look easy. Mm -hmm. So they look very, very easy to a typical audience member. The purpose of that move is to convey something else other than strength it's supposed to convey something else, something maybe lofty or something artistic, something beautiful, for mm -hmm. example. When you put them into a competitive environment, they're now being reduced to their technical aspects so that somebody can like 
get this many points here and this many points here, it's very, very hard to look at a dodge in that way. So for this is where training comes in as a judge, hopefully for a dodge specifically, but for every competition, right? You wanna have people who know the work, they know the art form, they've done it, they've been in those situations before, they know, look, this is a really easy move, but they made that look really lovely, but I know that it doesn't take a lot to get through that and that maybe, you know, majority of beginners would be able to pull that off. But somebody tried an overhead with an arabesque line and it takes a lot of training to be able to do that. Maybe, you know, maybe the foot line was a little bit off, but I have a lot of appreciation for all the other techniques that had to go into that move. So I'm going to avoid giving you a direct answer to your question, but okay. I think that that can help people understand what goes into judging. Oh, definitely. And I think the people that are watching that are interested in competition will be able to think about the structure of their routine, you know, yeah. when they're going into it. And, you know, it's not just throw everything but the kitchen sink into there, but yes. what, yes. what will show you in the best light and impress the judges, you know, and put your best foot out there. Like you said, like if something is only working 80% of the time, do you really want to risk putting that out on that competition floor? Yeah. If that's yeah. supposed to be your best example. So yeah. the uh, best situation would be if people know your judges are well trained. Yes. Then we can really talk about and, and and competitors really understand the results of a competition. It's when we start to get naive judges who don't really know that specific work that it gets very confusing or frustrating for everyone involved. You worked as a judge for a lot of competitions. Um, Talk to me about that experience, like you being brought in, is it when the organizers like call you and whatnot, talk to us about that whole process for you coming in, working as a judge, like are you working on a specific thing or? Um, I started judging very early on and I was drawing on my like overall dance experience to do it. I think my love for technique and also for looking at dance from a very analytical way. That's how I saw what I was doing as a judge. And I recognize that I'm not, I don't love competing obviously. And it is a very intense environment to be in, but um, I view what I do now as helping people be the best dancer that they can be. Sounds corny, but. Um, so not corny, since not I corny at all. That's yeah. how we roll. It's not corny. It's, all, it's what we all want. Exactly. It is. Want. We just Obviously. want to be the best version of ourselves. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I found myself judging just because like what I said to you before that the people who were established performers at that time in that generation, um, if they're getting involved in the competition world, it's usually as judges. So we're bringing a different perspective We're bringing a perspective from a time where there weren't popular competitions and when salsa or art you know latino dances were not looked at from that kind of analytical perspective at the same time i'm bringing a broader knowledge of what i do um, to my work um, for judges for most of the time especially thanks to billy and katie they established a very um a very clear set of criteria for the competitions that we have now this was really missing in the before time um, when competitions were more like audience participation contests. Mm -hmm. So you go to, you go out there and you ask your friends to come and they shout for you and they make you the most popular uh, winner. Yeah, competitor. it's like the applause um, meter competitions. Yes, exactly. And there were a lot of those at those before that. And now, now we have, we have established competitions with criteria. Usually my, my job, my job is to evaluate everyone on those same criteria and then adjusting my perspective based on their category and their skill level. Do you see a difference with the competitions between the ones that we have here in the U.S. like Summit and then the ones that you go judge internationally? Yeah. So if it's a Summit sanctioned event, that's easy. It's going to be conducted with the same set of rules and expectations as a Summit. Um, and Billy and Katie have had a really broad reach in terms of designing that system. I think it it helps people take out the subjectiveness of salsa. Uh, so it, you know, it, it minimizes arguments about who should have won and why and whatever. It increases integrity and fairness. That's the most important thing. 
That being said, there are other competitions outside of the U.S. or maybe even other competitions in the U.S. that are run by different people. They have different goals. Okay. Um, so maybe they don't exactly want to, they haven't defined the best salsa dancer as someone who has good timing, musicality, di uh, difficulty, or just, right, all the other showmanship, all the other criteria. Maybe that's not how they think about the best okay. salsa dancer. Maybe they think about it in a different way. In which case, my job is to figure out what that way is and judge people according to those set of new criteria. Right. I, I remember. Um, there was an odd competition that I was in where each judge had a different uh, construct that they were supposed to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So one judge was judging timing, another judge was judging musicality, and another judge was judging like costumes. Uh, that doesn't work mathematically. And I know because I study psychometrics and epidemiology, <laughs> which has a lot to do with judging criteria. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work mathematically. I'm just going to tell you right now. Billy and Katie's system is better. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask because I, I did ballroom for a little bit and I remember hearing all the time about the competition circuit with ballroom. It's so political, right? You, you always hear that about ballroom. It's so political and who wins and da da da. Do you think it's the same in the salsa competition world? Because salsa is not as rigidly structured worldwide as the ballroom is. So. Do you see that same political issue with the salsa scene competitions? Uh, it is starting to get that way. And I'll tell you why I think it can get that way. It's when people start to collect power, however it happens to work in that this particular system. They see a way to collect power for themselves and they want to hold on to it and decide who else gets to have it and who doesn't. That's how it works in ballroom. It's a small world. They have their system really set up. They've been doing it for a very, very long time. They know how they decide who gets to win and who doesn't. And I'm not talking about winning in competition. I'm talking about winning in that world, mm -hmm. being important and powerful in that world. Salsa actually, because it's not organized, is actually an advantage because it means a small amount of people can't decide who gets to be important and who isn't. There are so many people involved and actually the more people, the better, right? The more power brokers, the better. Yeah. You've got one person who's deciding, I make the rules, I choose the people who are going to decide based on those rules, then you really start to have uh, you know, a consolidation of power that can be very, very political. And we obviously don't want that. So it's good right now that we have a big, messy, wonderful, beautiful community. Um, the trick is to, I think, to, for someone like Billy, who is arguably one of the most important competition organizers in the world right now, um, is to really constantly refine the way he thinks about what his influence is in the community. And then that trickles down into how he organizes his events, how he chooses his judges, who he's going to entrust with deciding who wins or loses. And then those judges have to also be as honest and as fair as they possibly can. But there are some small rules, for example, like at the summit, you're not allowed to talk to any of the competitors while they're still competing in their events. So even after they competed in one event and they want to, um, they have another event tomorrow, but they want to know what you think about their dancing. You can't talk to them. You're not supposed to. Some people do. Yeah. The rules are there for a reason, right? So it can be as fair as possible. Um, there's also this thing of if I take a private lesson with a judge, then he or she will view me more positively and then will give me a little boost in my scores. Mm-hmm. I obviously don't do that. Some people do. Not a good idea. And so there are some things that organizers can do to prevent that sort of thing from happening. But I will be so upset yeah. if our world becomes like the ballroom world. So I guess then you're opposed to the idea of actually there being some sort of council, if you will, or a salsa syllabus that was like internationally recognized like we have, like there is in the ballroom world. Yeah, I mean, there have been many attempts and I'm guilty of it too. I really thought that this was the right way to go when I started BASO. One of my biggest goals was to create 
this said syllabus. Yeah, a lot of people have talked like, about it, you know. But. Yeah, we talk about it. But the reason why it doesn't happen is because there are so many people involved, so many perspectives on what salsa is. And thankfully, like so many, thankfully, nobody has gotten their hands on it convincingly. Mm -hmm. So I mean, people have tried to say, I own this and I make the rules. But the rest of the community doesn't endorse them, so it doesn't go anywhere, thankfully, right? But the efforts are ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. The danger is obviously that you get a small group of people who will become very powerful and they decide. If that board of people is truly representative of the community, then that it probably would work. We would be more efficient. We would definitely be more organized. But I highly doubt that the people who make it to that position of power are going to be representative of the people who dance salsa, who love salsa, especially the people who it's their heritage, their ancestors created it, their ancestors kept it alive, they're keeping it alive today. It doesn't make any sense for someone who just decided, I'm somebody in salsa, I'm gonna tell everybody what to do. And the way it works in ballroom is you decide, right? You get your board, but they charge you, they charge the members. Yep to let them organize you and tell you what to do. Yep. You can do these events, you cannot do these events. You can compete at this and you cannot compete at that. You can have a party, you can't have a party. Like you're paying them for their membership because they've convinced you that what you're buying is valuable, but who decides? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's such a great way to put it. And you know, the thing is, and, and I'm, I'm of the mindset that I hope it doesn't happen just because of this. If I think about who would make up this uh, imaginary council of, of salsa pioneers, if you will, I don't know how many women would be on that list. Yeah, but look at Billy's judging panel. Oh, absolutely. That's. There, there's a lot of fabulous and incredibly strong women on that panel. I think I've reached out to every single one of you for the show. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool. You have to admit, when people start complaining that there's too many women in power, there's too many female judges, I know and I can, I can say for a fact that Billy has put a lot of thought into who he chooses as judges. There are obviously many things that go into making that decision, but intentionally deliberately putting women in positions of power is the best thing you can do as a man who already benefits from male privilege the best thing you can do is be an ally and open the paths for women who deserve to be there and that's what he does i mean it's great you know so yeah if you can put a lot of good thought into it and you're like uh, consulting with lots of other people and you're listening to others and you're you're doing the best that you can to like really understand what your community is asking a lot of good things can happen so let's talk a little bit about you as a successful woman in this industry you've worked with so many people as we've talked about you know you had your work with Tomas with Santo Rico your work with Daniel uh, and then, you know, you doing work with Billy, I found somewhere a video of you with Elvis. You're also now working with Edwin. You are very high in demand. I mean, I'm pretty sure besides those three gentlemen that I've mentioned recently, there are plenty of men in this industry that would give their left arm to work with you. Um, talk to me about how it is that you became such a success. What made you be a success on your own. On my own. Um, I don't want to minimize this and I don't want anyone to ever think that, that anyone thinks this is easy. It's obviously very hard, but I, since I have already told you that I don't do well with competition, I also just don't do well competing in a larger sense in anything. And mm -hmm. the only thing I'm able to do is try my best and do what I love. Dancing obviously is so important to me. It's been hard over this last year to even know who I am without dancing. 
And if I just think about myself and the path that I took over many years, every single day was just me wanting to dance in the best way that I possibly could. I think maybe a part of why I ended up doing other things is because I also love to teach, but it's just because I've had to analyze dance in such a way so that I understand it and it just so happens to be helpful for other people. That puts you in, you know, positions of visibility for others. Um, it also makes you employable in the industry because you can teach. Um, performing is something that I've just always done. Um, the hardest part of what you just described is working with partners. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Oh, it's so like true. Practicing, teaching, <laughs> dancing, the willingness to get on stage, all those things, fine, easy. In salsa, you need a partner to do it and to do it well. Yeah. Right? Especially if you want to fly. You can't do that on your own. <laughs> oh, my God. If you want to fly. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I mean, all the people that you mentioned, they're wonderful people. That They're people that I really trust. Um, they're also men, and I have to say this explicitly, they're men who at many points in our time together have deliberately made sure that I get what I deserve even when people haven't given it a second thought or like are kind of denying some opportunities to me without realizing it. Um, I can't tell you how many times Edwin, and he's going to be embarrassed that I said this, when we're getting paid, like we as a group or in a partnership, and he realizes that one of us women has gotten less pay than he does. I cannot tell you how many times he has taken money out of his own pocket to give it to me because wow. it's what he was fair, what he knows is fair but that still happens right in the industry especially yeah. when it comes to money because we can talk about all kinds of other things expectations for what salsa women should be what we should look like what we're supposed to do you know the fact that we can't perform that much without a partner that women don't dance don't partner with each other all that stuff but when it comes down to money and you're at an, a festival and it's time to get paid the mm -hmm. person that they deal with is your male partner uh -huh. almost always 100 percent your male partner obviously there are exceptions and those are wonderful why is that, right? And why do men get paid more than women everywhere? Especially now during the pandemic when women are, you know, people are losing their jobs, obviously. Who's the one who's gonna lose their job first? Women. women. Brown women, black women, women of color. It's gonna be us first, you know? And so what can we do? I really would love for women to just work together. We are probably not gonna change the patriarchy today. We might not even be able to change the patriarchy in our lifetime. But if there are more women, and especially more people of color, in positions of power, and we turn around and reach out for other people like us, it's just the easiest, most direct way to achieve equity in the small world that we're working in. It's just the most direct way. Like we can wax philosophical about how we're going to overcome the patriarchy or we're going to overcome racial injustice. Um, but it's really simple. We're in a small world. And if you have a chance to uplift a woman or a person of color, do it. And then when you're in that position yourself, turn around and bring somebody else with you. Uh, before, I mean, there's still so much that we could talk about. I can't even because... You have so much experience and you talk so beautifully. Uh, you're very well spoken. Um, and I still wanted to show so much videos. I mean, I got the team Fajardo over here. Uh, talk to me real quick about the experience of sharing the stage with all these beautiful dancers and how team Fajardo came to be. Oh gosh, team Fajardo is, I don't know how it ever happened. I can't believe that it happened. I mean, these people that we're watching right now, each and every one of them, they're not just nice people. They're not just talented people, but these are people that I trust with my life. I love them so dearly. I mean, this woman right here, Jessica, she's my best friend. She's a very much like a life partner, right? These are not just people that I dance alongside. So I don't know how this worked out. All I can say is that they, this group came about in my life when I had made a commitment to honesty 
about who I am, what I want, and especially my vulnerabilities. So my weaknesses, the things that I was struggling with, the things, not just in dance, but emotionally, things I wanted in life. When I really started showing that to other people, these are the people that ended up being around. They're the people who stuck around. They're the people who understood, who helped in any way that they could, who also shared their lives with me. And because of that, we're together. It just so happens we dance well together and wanted to commit to something beautiful like this. Um, Billy is, as many people know, a soloist. He's best um, on his own. Mm -hmm. And so it took a lot of convincing to get him to endorse this particular group. But I can tell you that because Billy can only work with people that he trusts, he had to really like get to know each and every one of the members of Team Fajardo. And I did a lot of like, you know, facilitating of those relationships so that this could happen and we could have these beautiful moments on stage. This is definitely, if, if my dance life were to end today, these would definitely be my most cherished memories. This, you. I know that this routine has been shared. I don't even know how many times on Facebook. I feel like everybody always loves this piece, watching it live. I mean, the videos just don't do it justice. I remember, well, I think we were in Connecticut when you guys performed it for the first time as a team. And I think Billy was hurt. So you guys only did two couples. And Darlin and I were standing next to him watching the performance. And as soon as it finished, we immediately looked at him. And at the same time, I went, I want to learn that. Because <laughs> it just, it's so graceful and elegant. Did you guys choreograph this together? Yep. We did. This piece really um, is all of us. It says something about each of us, something special that we do individually. Um, and I can't think of a better way to manifest the beauty of our relationships and our friendships and our experiences together than with an actual piece that we can do together and share with others. You know, this happened went one by one. So you know, I've known Edwin for so many years. We go back to the Santa Rico days and, and each of these, um, building the team is very much like me calling them and being like, hey, I miss you. Uh, Want to dance? <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, you know, there, I have this wonderful friend and she's really talented. Want to train together? Yes. Oh, you know, since we're training already and doing this thing, why don't you come and like dance in the same room with us? Yes. And it's <laughs> one by one. The people that I love most in the world, I wanted them to be next to me. I wanted to be physically with them doing whatever it is that we're supposed to do in this life. They said yes. And yeah, I'm going to say here we are, but that's not where we are right now. <laughs> Jessica we actually said videos. Team Fajardo could, came to be only because of you. So that's your, that's your soul sister right there saying that. And I love this. This was the most recent routine you guys did, right? The team hustle. Yeah. I loved this piece. I got excited when I saw it. The Bring costumes are fabulous. Them. You designed the costumes, correct? Yes, I make all the costumes. I design and actually construct all of the costumes. And you and Jessica have a new business, right? We do. Please yes, plug that do. for those that are listening. They want to know where they can follow you guys and buy your stuff. Uh, well, in this pandemic, I just wanted to say that we've been really um, almost like relearning everything and salsa, exploring everything, um, everything Afro-Cuban. Um, and so we've been studying with someone, a wonderful, wonderful woman, since we're on the topic of women. Kathy Hernandez, um, she was my teacher in LA. She's an Afro-Cuban dancer. But she has, she's one of the people who just got online right away. As soon as we were sheltering in place, she figured out the technology. She really committed to it. She wanted to keep her community together. And because of that, I got to see her more often and got to learn from her. And I hadn't seen her since I was living in LA. And so Jessica and I went through this journey together as we do for most journeys in our lives. Um, and we, we found ourselves a part of this wonderful group of people, a community of people who, who love Afro-Cuban dance, music, art, 
Um, she runs this program that is very comprehensive. So not only do you learn how to dance Afro-Cuban, but you get to learn history, music, you get to learn how to play instruments. It's just, just wonderful. And since we got connected more and more with individuals in that group, um, we noticed that people were uh, looking for Afro-Cuban skirts, just folklorico skirts to mm -hmm. wear in class. And oddly, it's that kind of thing where it has to be custom made because it has to fit your waist and it can't be too long or too short. Yep. So it's one of those things that it's you have to find someone who can make it specifically for you, who knows what the needs are in, you know, in the particular dance. And then they're either one one like volume for like app. Um, for like ha Franco Haitian dances and there are another volume for Yoruba dances. So it's very specific. Um, so we just, someone asked us to start making them and then we just, you know, we both sew and, and we made all our costumes for Basso for many years. And so we just started making these uh, wonderful things. So we're using African wax prints, um, which are characteristically African and uh, just stunning and gorgeous. And it's such a joy to even touch the fabric and work with it and construct it into something that we know somebody's gonna have many happy moments dancing in um our company our business is called Ana Isa yeah just shared yeah. the link on the on the comments so if you guys sure. can click yeah. on it it's at oh, Etsy.com so oh good so Jessica's linking uh, she's linking Kathy. everything that the Great. Katie Hernandez she's the linking site. the Etsy shop yes. and, and Katie's uh website as well yeah and so we're actually taking this time also to just design things from our own cultures i think at the bottom line is we really want people especially people of color to have a way to show who they are and what they wear and especially in their dancing and so we'll be doing a lot more of that especially since we're not dancing right now i know right well uh before we say goodbye because we've run out of time this i could talk to you all day um i did go over a little bit because we had technical difficulty i wanted to make sure we got to as much of it uh before we sign off i would love for you to give one piece of advice to women that are interested in coming into the dance scene and while you talk about that we're going to leave you with footage of a social dance between you and Edwin from back in the day. Oh my gosh, heart squeeze. So, I miss Edwin so much. So, what do you have Heart to I, say for our lady listeners that want to get advice into the scene? to women? The most important thing is don't give up. Obviously, do not give up. We, if you think about the women that you've encountered in salsa or even in your lives. Some of them might have disappeared. Some of them might have dropped off. Some of, it, some of it might have been really obvious. Like for me, I know some very, very talented women in Zanza who just disappeared and I didn't know what happened to them. And in a competitive patriarchal way of thinking, I thought um, maybe they just weren't good enough. Maybe they just like, you know, couldn't stay at the top, maybe blah, 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 until I realized most often they've encountered some terrible difficulty that is gender specific. Yep. They were either being abused by their dance partner, abused by their teacher, abused by their life partner. And all of that on top of trying to just have a career, a visible one, is just too much. You don't know what people are going through, but most likely the women that you know are struggling with something. Don't let anyone tell you that you just need to work harder, try harder, there are forces, tremendous forces that have been around for generations that are designed to make sure that we never get to do the things that we want to do. Don't give up. Find other people who are like you. Find other people who understand, people who support you. Don't let them go. And we can all do this together. Latoy, thank you so much for giving of your time, for your incredible wisdom for being such an inspiration and role model to us in this industry in terms of what we can achieve. I know personally, when I'm doing a lot of tricks, I'm like, what would a toy do up here? And so I just wanna thank you for everything that you've done for all of us. Thank you for continuing to inspire us and love you. And I cannot wait to see you in person, hopefully soon. Thank you. I can't wait for a big hug when we see each other next. Absolutely. I really appreciate being here with you. I think about you a lot also. I hope you do a lot more of these. Um, I'll be looking, I'll be watching. 
I'm going to message you after this. So maybe you can send me this video since we did it on your page. Um, so I can then post it for everyone. And hopefully you will all join me next week when my guest is the fabulous Jennifer O'Coin. Awesome. Thank you, Otto. I love you. Thank you. Love you. Bye, everybody. Bye.